Ladies and gentlemen, sorry to startle you there. Uh, ordinarily, we would let you finish your lunch in peace and quiet, but because we are trying to make up a little bit of time, uh, if we can prevail upon you, we will start moving forward with the formal part of the presentation. Serving will continue. Please continue to eat and enjoy your dessert and coffee, uh, so don't feel restrained. But just so that we can try to bring our schedule back on track or as close to track as possible, uh, we will start moving forward. As I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, we do have both a luncheon speaker today, but also two more Space Pioneer Awards to present. We'll now present the fifth Space Pioneer Award for 2012 ISDC, and this is in the category of business and entrepreneur. And this first award will be going to Art Dula, uh, a man that I think is probably known to many of you. I have a few remarks, uh, just some introduction to provide before I invite Art to come up here. But, uh, I think many of you know he's been involved in the space business and in the space law. But his participation and, and what he has been awarded this award for actually covers several different categories. Uh, he's a space lawyer patent attorney, and, and I find this quite fascinating, uh, the literary executor for the major science fiction author, Robert Heinlein. He also serves as a trustee of the Robert A. and Virginia Heinlein Prize Trust. In 2006, the Trust awarded the first Heinlein Prize in the amount of $500,000 to Peter Diamandis, another man who is well known to people in this room. And that was for outstanding personal initiative and significant progress in commercial space activities. The Trust has done amazing work in creating and managing the Heinlein Prize. And the purpose of the Heinlein Prize is to encourage and reward progress in commercial space activities that advances Robert and his wife Virginia's dream of humanity's future in space. I think some of you would also be aware that Art is the CEO of the private space flight company Excalibur Almaz, which is trying to uh, convert Russian manned space vehicles to commercial use. And if I'm correct, Art will be presenting on that notion at, I think, uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. So, on that note, it's my great pleasure. And in fact, before I do that, I, I have to add a, a personal comment here. And it's funny how these things uh, come around in life. I was speaking to Art earlier today. Art is actually the very first person from the L5 Society or the National Space Society that I ever met. And we met in Australia in 1988 at a commercial space conference. Probably the first commercial space conference to be held in Australia. And at the time, Art was there trying to sell a concept of commercial launch services on the Proton launch vehicle. Something that was well ahead of its time and was trying to promote that idea to the Australian government. And it was quite a visionary thing, and I find it quite remarkable to now be here as chairman of the NSS Board of Directors to make this award to Art. So, Art, can you please come up here? to receive your Space Pioneer. sitting here with me. And one of the things that, you know, a young man in that position will promise almost anything. <laughs> and I promised that we would spend New Year's Eve of the year 2000 on the moon. <laughs> So now you know where all of my motivation came from to take and do these things in space. And by the way, Kirby, we did sell three of those proton rockets. We sold them to Hughes Communication. Uh, we bought them for 20 million, sold them for 23. It took about six weeks. Let's see, 2023. I made my 3%. It was a good commercial deal. 
but they couldn't get permission to take them out of the United States, the satellites. Now, of course, the Proton is a major launcher. In the future, SpaceX, Blue Origins, Virgin Galactic, when it decides to go to orbit, x when it decides to go to orbit, many others. It's going to be like airlines. It takes more energy to take me to Australia than it would take to take you to orbit. So just think about that. If it was energy, if it was the cost of energy and we could do it with electricity, it would cost a dollar and a half. So I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank my wife for forgiving me for not taking her to the moon in 2000, and to thank you for giving me the moon in 2012. I think you'll all agree that Art is a truly worthy recipient um, of a Space Pioneer Award for so many years of service. <coughs> Excuse me. Our sixth Space Pioneer Award to be presented at this year's conference is in the science and engineering category. And this award goes to Dr. Robert Farquhar for his articles and papers on orbital mechanics, efficient trajectories, and innovative methods for the use of the Lagrangian points. And as an old L5er, that's where I started in 1985. This is something that, again, has personal significance to me. I'll give a quick background before we call Dr. Farquhar up to the stage. Uh, the award is specifically for his work and publications in the area of halo orbits, an orbit around a point with no physical object at that point, and multiple lunar swingbys, as well as managing programs for NASA and several different companies. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of his key concepts that you can orbit a Lagrangian point with less station keeping fuel than if you attempt to hover at the centre of that point is a key methodology used by multiple spacecraft today. We also note the publication of his book, 50 Years on the Space Frontier, in 2011. His current interest in using Lagrange points as way stations for crewed interplanetary vehicles parallels several other similar recent papers. And it is our great hope that this will lead to a groundswell of support for this concept. So we are truly talking to someone who uh, has done so much for us in this world. So please, can I invite Dr. Farquhar to receive the Space Pioneer Award. Okay, I'm supposed to say something here. Uh, what I'm looking forward to is when they have an award for troublemakers. I mean, I think I'm number one there. A lot of people at NASA would agree with me. Even when I worked for them, I was causing trouble. But uh, I don't deserve this whole thing. There's so many people help me. You know, a matter of fact, uh, one of them is sitting right over there. Uh, it's common knowledge uh, that Dave Dunham does all the work and I take all the credit. Stand up, Dave. And, okay, he's going to say something else. And uh, I, I also have to thank my wife for helping me all these years. I promised her to go to an asteroid. And I did put some plaques on the spacecraft that I wasn't supposed to do, of course. You're not supposed to put personal plaques on NASA spacecraft, but she now has her own plaque on the asteroid Eros, named after the god of love. That makes sense. I talked to the NASA guys about it one time at, at one other conference, and, uh, and they were pretty unhappy that I put the plaques on, on the near spacecraft, and I also put them on the New Horizons spacecraft going out to Pluto. I told them, if they don't like it, why don't they go out and they can take them off now? <laughs> it's going to be hard to do. Well, 
you know, nowadays uh, it, it's rather difficult for an, an individual to promote any ideas. Now everything is done by committees. This is something I don't like. I hope we get back to individuals being able to come in with new ideas and so forth, but they only listen to committees nowadays. And then even after you come up with the ideas and the thing is going forward, you have millions of review teams doing things and, and checking everything. When Dave Dunham and I did the first swing bys of the moon, the first in, in history, uh, where we used the, the moon to get the energy to get out to different bodies, uh, just the two of us worked on it and the whole thing happened. We didn't need any stinking review team. <laughs> mm. Now, I'm going to tell you just one last thing here, which may be controversial. I don't know who's all in the room. Uh, I hope uh, Frank Wolf isn't here. Uh, I've been working with, the, uh, with people in Manchuria. I just got back from there a week or so ago, and now I'm the new Manchurian candidate. <laughs> so Frank Wolf better watch out, because somebody might show me the Queen of Diamonds, and you know what happens then. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I'd like to see uh, us have more cooperation with the Chinese somehow. I'm now, good, that's what I, uh, all of the students there certainly want to cooperate with the, with, with the United States on, in space exploration. Uh, they treated me like I was some kind of rock star when I said that. So uh, I'm now the, uh, Wait a minute. The Chief International Academic Advisor for the Harbin Institute of Technology in Harbin, Manchuria. So uh, I'm going to try to promote this thing. All the other countries of the world are, are cooperating with the Chinese in space exploration except for the United States. There's something wrong here. So I hope this gets changed. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Farquhar, and uh, I think we are privileged to be here to have two great men in the room with us today, and it's wonderful to be able to honour them. <clears throat> but we will move on to our luncheon presentation now, and our speaker, Rick Tomlinson, as I'm sure, doesn't need a great deal of uh, in introduction to most of the people in this room. However, it is quite a uh, spectacular, shall we say, uh, CV and uh, Rick and I had been talking a little bit earlier about some of the different highlights and I, I personally would like to read out some of the, the variety of things that he's been involved in. Um, I think most people know that um, Rick has been a great space visionary for many, many years and he was listed by Space News as one of the world's most influential space leaders. Uh, he's credited with helping create the new space commercial space industry. <clears throat> that today includes companies such as Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, and some of the investors like Paul Allen and Larry Page. He was the co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation and led the team that took over the Mir space station for a year. <clears throat> he also signed up the first space tourist and has spoken as an expert witness before Congress six times on space policy. And in fact, uh, when we were chatting earlier, one of the things that uh, Rick was mentioning was the fact that he testified back in, I think it was 95 or 96, and was talking about uh, being able to utilise uh, the, the International Space Station as a catalyst or a mechanism for commercial space flight and more commercial industry. And I think it was a proud moment what we saw earlier this week. <clears throat> He's also involved with uh, the kicking off of the International Space University and also helped start the Lunar Prospector project, which discovered water on the moon and helped or founded several other uh, frontier enabling projects and organisations. Probably more recently, better known for having started the Orbital Outfitters spacesuit company. He's a founding trustee of the X Prize, and uh, more recently, he founded the Texas Space Alliance and the Earthlight Institute. <clears throat> and he's now working on a book about asteroids. I mean, I think this Rick has pretty much covered just about everything that we're talking about at this conference. I think he's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post and Space News, and his writings have appeared worldwide. With that not so brief introduction, please, Rick, would you please come up and uh, speak to us? Yeah. 
you know, it's a funny thing about bios. Um, he goes on and on about me. And now, we've got people at this conference, and all, he ha all they have to say is, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Buzz Aldrin. So I think shorter is probably better so, when you reach a certain level. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I uh, ran across uh, a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Covey, uh, who you've seen on Discovery Channel, and he handed me a piece of asteroid. You know, these, these people are spending trillions of dollars to go out there and uh, get these. And to paraphrase a bad line from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I've already got one. So. <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the revolution. I want to give uh, a quick update. I'm not going to do a commercial. Some people have given speeches that were basically commercials for their companies. I'll do a little of that. Some people have given incredible travelogues, as we saw yesterday at lunch. God, I wish I would had a trip like that, I, although I've been in a so uh, Soyuz capsule and I probably would freak out. Um, and, um, and then some of the great stuff we've seen. And first of all, I, I just want to congratulate the team that put on this conference. I know they got an incredibly late start. Um, but uh, with, with Deb and Paul and all the other people here, it's, it's just been an amazing event. I just... we, put on, we put on a lot. I've been involved with a lot of conferences. I know what goes on. And so anytime I've had to ask for something, like, Please, please do, you know. And they've just been like that. They've been great. And, and uh, I, I just want to thank NSS for that. Um, real quick update. Um, yes, ADD does have its benefits. So um, one of the things uh, I've been working on, I am a Texan. My family's been in Texas, Texas Rangers, blah, 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 for many years. Uh, finally came home after a 28-year arc through Manhattan and L.A. Um, and uh, I was actually working for Accomack County for a while uh, where Wallops is, helping them understand commercial space and new space. It was making me crazy that my home state was not getting it. So we started a project called Sleeping Giant. Um, and yes, it is based on the line after Pearl Harbor, uh, except maybe the boom that wakes up Texas will be a sonic boom coming from New Mexico. Um, so uh, we formed the Texas Space Alliance. Uh, I've, uh, uh, this is our goal. We're working on trying to get a Texas spaceport. We are working uh, on the legislative session that starts in Texas, by the way, is one of the uh, Texas gets beaten up a lot lately for some of our politicians, but uh, who we love. But um, one of the great things about Texas is they've designed a government where the legislature only gets to meet every two years, which is kind of awesome. I think. <laughs> but. Uh, so we're preparing for the next legislative session. We have a five-point agenda. We're going to be going in and uh, hopefully trying to create our version of Space Florida, uh, space ports, and, and lots of other things. Bob Lancaster is the new head of the Texas Space Alliance, just back from a tour of Af Afghanistan, uh, Air Force guy. I don't know these military guys are moving into the take over the lead in space movement. Uh, Bob looks much better in a suit than I do, and uh, he is a really sharp guy. If you ever want to talk to anybody in the Texas Space Alliance, Bob's the guy. This is the, I want to talk about this just for a moment before I start. People have been asking. The Earth Light Institute is an organization um, that I think is probably going to be my culmination organization that I work with. I say that today. Tomorrow I'll be like, oh, something shiny. Um, <laughs> but. The uh, Earthlight Institute, basically the, the concept, I didn't want to have too spacey a name, frankly. I want to reach outside of our community. Um, and uh, we actually, it's, it's DBA for the Earthlight Foundation, but I didn't want to have um, an organization coming out into this community that could, uh, uh, you know, that had the name Earthlight and could be abbreviated as ELF all at once. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the idea of the Earthlight Institute um, is, is, well, it comes from a story by John Young, who told me when got, folks were on the moon that there was a bright and amazing blue-green light that the cameras at the time couldn't really capture. Um, and I, it occurred to me that that light, that spectra of light, would be unique to light uh, as to light coming from a, a sun, exactly like ours, bans, bouncing off a nitrogen-oxygen life-bearing planet like the Earth. It's a unique spectrum. So the Earth Light Institute... Um, is focused on carrying the light of life to worlds now dark. The 
Part of our, our job here, by the way, is also to contextualize what everybody's been doing in new space, in commercial space. I've been fighting that fight for a long time. A lot of us have in this room. Uh, a lot of heroes in this room that have been really out there on the front lines. And aside from wanting to have some fun talking about the destinations, I also wanted to recontextualize what it is we're doing in space. Why are we doing this? It's not rich boys and their toys. It's not, quote unquote, I hate the word, tourism. There's a lot going on here, and what people are witnessing and don't realize it is the beginning of one of the most grand moments in the history of humanity and life itself. And we want to get that back into things. So we're a vision-based organization. To quote Mr. Heinlein, who said we're uh, 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere, we're letting commercial space and new space take care of the 100 miles up. We're focused on the anywhere. The Earthlight Project uh, has the Institute, the Earthlight Foundation, which is an endowment. All donations to the Earthlight Institute will be taxed, part of the money going into an endowment, until I can find another billionaire. I had one once, almost, and uh, you, know, you, you should get one if you're in the space field. Just <laughs> take out an ad, I don't know, Craigslist, billionaire needed, space, may end up with a million, don't know. Um, we're working on the space development matrix. Uh, yes, we do have encyclopediagalactica.com. Um, the idea of the space development matrix is you go in, you, uh, it'll be an ongoing wiki-based and eventually three-dimensional uh, interactive uh, matrix of information about space that will include development. The word matrix comes from a thing that Morris Hornick, who was uh, one of the uh, fellows that worked with uh, Gerard O'Neill, was working on before the movie. Um, and the idea there is that you go in and you'll be able to find topics. Let's say you're interested in lunarized drilling. You go in and you look up lunarized drilling. It will be color coded based on TRL levels. Color code red, TRL one through three, that means it's sort of theoretical, it's been talked about. T uh, color code yellow, three through six, those of you who know TRL know what I mean, I'm probably getting it wrong by one or two. Um, and then TRL green, six through nine, means it's been there, done that, that's probably your luncheon speaker at our conference. Um, so if it's yellow or red, you can drop in your name, your company, I'm an ISU group, I'm a NASA team, I'm an individual company, here's my business plan, here's my contact info, here's my angle on this, let's go. And here's my window, what I think it's going to take for me to do this. And then you can start working on it. The idea is a three-dimensional checklist, moon, Mars, and free space being our foci, foci uh, that says where we're going and what we need to do so that we can start understanding what's missing. And some of the brilliant minds, and when I say brilliant minds, I mean the people in this room and the people that couldn't afford to come to this lunch, the younger people that are out there. Um, and so they can get in there and get involved. Um, and so that'll be an ongoing uh, organization. And uh, by the way, we're looking for people to work with us. Uh, Two o'clock downstairs in the McPherson room, we're going to have a little meeting. We are not, by the way, I want to be very clear, an advocacy organization. NSS does that very well. Space Frontier does that very well. Mars Society does that well. Moon Society does that well. We are settlement, all settlement, all the time and only. So we're not an AIAA committee that's looking at settlement. It's not one of the things we're about. It's all we are about. Um, vision, Art, and Media Project. Oh, by the way, the Realware Project, uh, I meant to mention that. If you aren't going to do an individual project, you can get into open source hardware. There is no real open source hardware yet. There are people on the net saying they have open source hardware and you're working on it, but until you have interactive, globally useful CAD systems that anybody in the world can reach into and start with version histories, et cetera, we don't have complete tools yet. So we have the head of advanced projects from Dyson Limited, the vacuum cleaner people are, is the head of that project with us. Vision and Art Media Project is headed by Pat Rawlings, who some of you may know, space artist, extraordinary, incredibly cool guy. Uh, we have the head ba uh, animator from Babylon 5, uh, Jeff Sheets, and some other people involved there. Um, the idea is creating a vision that's, that is, is realistic in its parameters. You know, uh, I love the aliens and magic jump gates, but we need to show what it's really going to be like. If you, need to, if you want to see a picture of a space colony, there may be two or three of them that are somewhat recent. Otherwise, you've got to go to Don Davis in 1970-something. All right, we want to create the new imagery that sells the, and is based on real technology. Um, and then we have a Space Law and Policy Council, Steve Wolf, who wrote the original Space Settlement Act, which I'm going to come back to in a minute, is running that project, and he's come back into the field. Um, 
Community and Culture of the New Worlds Conference. I love sort of messing with people. So we want to have like a Mars day, a moon day, you know, and we'll put Spudis in charge of the moon and maybe Zubrin on Mars and we'll have like a moon mud wrestling contest or something and, and uh, you know, and, and Lee Valentine from SSI can do free space. Uh, but what we're going to do then is in the mornings we'll have commonalities, radiation shielding, life support, things that are common no matter where you go once you're beyond social media, et cetera. And then we're going to do some big ideas. Yes, we do have a book called Asteroids. The original title was uh, Ragnarok, Death from Outer Space, because um, we wanted to play into the fact that uh, the Mayan hysteria that's going to hit, uh, I think we're going to change that now to Asteroids, Threat and Promise. Uh, the Watch, which was our asteroid watch program we had funded. Library of Hewlett Knowledge was the uh, library on the moon. Um, Films and media, we're looking at creating some animated films and media that will actually go into real production. Um, Permission to Dream was a project that a guy, young guy named George Whitesides ran for me for a while, where we gave telescopes to uh, students around the world. It doesn't directly deal with settlement. I just like it. I think it's cool. Um, and uh, Science and Theology S Symposium, again, big ideas. They're not directly one-to-one -one with settlement, but I would love to have the religious guys and the physicists in one place for a weekend just to see what comes out of that. The, the Catholic Church is going through some interesting changes, for example, in that area. This is our slogan for Earthlight, to carry the light of life to places now dark, the seeds of life to places now dead, the eyes, hands, and, humani and, eye and minds of humanity to places yet unseen, untouched, and unknown. That's kind of airy-fairy stuff, I know. So you've got, to have, you've got to have a big vision, but then you've got to be able to walk the walk. And that's kind of been my philosophy and was pounded into me many, many years ago. And I got that from my boss, Dr. O'Neill, in SSI uh, back in the old days. Big vision. We used to have a conference we used to call the Not Ready for Primetime Conference uh, and reality. The reason that's there is we're not going to go public with the organization until July. So uh, I said to one of my friends, oh, we're just showing a little leg. And he said, that's a picture I need out of my head right now. <laughs> So uh, we're just talking about it. Now, let's talk about something else, uh, what, I'm, what I'm really here to talk about. That's the shuttle coming in for the, apparently the last flight. You may remember the news that day, people pulling out their hair and, uh, you know, uh, peers of buzz up on, oh, God, the program is over. Um, you know, we're, we're just done. Um, it, it's just, oh, you know, it's, it's the end of the world. Um, and I, I want to tell you. Now, go back to the Mayans for, this, for a second. I think the Mayans might have been right. Um, it is the end of a cycle, not the end of a, the Earth. It's the end of a cycle. Uh, I think it's the beginning of the cycle of human civilization and life moving off the Earth, and I think it started in 2012. Um, I think it's starting right now. It's the beginning of the frontier era. I think that by 2030, there are going to be people on the moon, Mars, and in free space. Uh, I think the first permanent communities beyond the Earth will be founded, the first products and inventions We'll be back here on the Earth, and uh, there'll be medical establishments in space, medical uh, technologies coming back to the Earth, et cetera, energy, et cetera, coming back. We're going to see the first, um, this year, we're going to see the first orbital delivery operations, first private microgravity experiments are being flown up on private microgravity brokers. Um, and then recently, we had something happen, and it wasn't, it didn't grab all the headlines, but it was key. We had the announcement that a private facility builder, owner, operator, Bigelow, was teaming up with a private transportation company, SpaceX. Think about that for a minute. Private transportation to a private destination. The government is no longer needed at that point. The baby was born. Now what's really funny about this, in an ironic sort of way, is that in this same year, we had a presidential candidate we were talking about earlier who had actually spoken at an L5 conference in the 80s, dare to mention the concept that we were going to, if we wanted to put a community on the moon by a certain date. Got laughed off the stage. The, the media, the politicians just laughed him off the stage. Within three weeks of that happening, some of the most savvy business people in this country announced they were going to mine asteroids. There is a major, major disconnect between our political and media class and the entrepreneurial class and the people that are actually making change in this country happening. 
it's, it's historic, and we're going to be looking back at that at, at some point and wondering what's happening. Now, the political class needs to get with it. See, there's a shift going on here. We've been fighting for what we need up until now. In the next year or so, it's going to shift, and NASA and the political class are going to have to fight to stay relevant. I believe that the uh, Senate launch system, for example, will die of embarrassment <laughs> within the next few years. I hope it does. Now, NASA can continue on its current path. It can waffle, pick, it parts, it pick its part, uh, self apart. Uh, as some of the people in NASA try, uh, like Lori Garber and other great people in NASA, try and embrace what's happening, and other people uh, in NASA and outside of NASA fight to keep the old ways. Um, uh, for example, some of those people who have gathered around Romney, I just want to give those people just a little secret. Old space ain't coming back. It's over. It's done. You're watching the death of it. It's over. If you want to watch The Walking Dead, there's a beautiful series on TV called that. But it ain't coming back. I don't care. It doesn't matter if Romney wins, Mr. Griffin. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to bring it back. The baby has been born. That's the baby in the car driving down the, the street in front of the house right now. So what we have to do now is look at how the government stays relevant. Because after all, we're the private sector and we're here to help you. <laughs> the, the people in our political system are obviously somewhat averse to challenges, change, uh, taking risks anything that has to do with uh, losing a vote or uh, a, a dollar in their wallet. But none of, nothing that I'm saying, nothing that NASA is doing, the government, et cetera, is doing, is going to stop this revolution. It just means that billions of dollars of our tax money is going to be wasted while the revolution is occurring that could be going into helping the revolution occur more quickly and more successfully. Now, the, uh, the irrelevance and the absence from this revolution may actually be a good thing in some people's minds. But why, why should we waste the legacy of, of, of people like Buzz, Mr. Farquhar, and all these other great people, and, and, and Carpenter, and all the thousands of people that did the job to make that happen? Why waste that legacy? We've invested billions, trillions almost, of dollars in space. The, the US public has made a decision to invest around $14 billion a year in space. As badly as they've been mistreated by the people who have wasted huge amounts of that money, they still give the money. So let's put it into something important. What I believe has to happen now is that NASA needs and the US government needs to take on a new set of rules. Lead, follow, and get out of the way. <laughs> now I'm going to start, I'm going to do this in reverse order and you'll see my purpose to this. Follow. The United States needs to recognize and embrace non-government developed, or NASA needs to recognize and embrace non-government developed technologies. Purchase goods and services from commercial vendors in every possible area of activity. Buy the ride, not the rocket. Don't reinvent the wheel just because your people didn't invent it the first time. Okay, if Maston and Armadillo come up with a good lunar lander, don't go rebuild it and then jump up and down and go, yeah, we did it. Use theirs. Offer prizes and support for activity and technology development, not yet in the realm of commercial develop investment. And become a solid customer for data and information acquisition from space. Get out of the way. Rewrite ITAR and other blo laws blocking US firms. Fire a lot of lawyers. <laughs> I love lawyers, if they're mine. But lower the paperwork barrier so small entrepreneurial firms who can't afford buildings full of lawyers can talk to other innovative firms across the sea. <laughs> Drop the FAR as the standard for contracts and get creative with a focused with a focus on shared risk research and pay for delivery services. Use common sense commercial best practices. It works everywhere outside of government. It works pretty darn good. Let's use it in the government, okay? Death to the far.
build on COTS. It was a successful program and apply it to other areas where it'll work. Move to the edge and build on commercial handoff from the beginning of exploration plans. In other words, if you're sending a government mission to the moon, Mars, or asteroids, build in the handoff at the end of that process, at the beginning of the process. Do not abandon in place. Do not declare it salvage. Start with the plan that when we've learned how to operate on another planetary body, if you're going to learn how to do that on the moon and go to Mars, that that is built in, that it's going to the private sector when we're done with it and we go do our Lewis and Clark job. Do it that way. Design U.S. government projects to move with the flow of commercial development. This is really critical and subtle and yet very, very, very dangerous if it's not handled right. Move with the flow. In other words, don't get your government project locked into that five or 20 year plan that Jeff was talking about. And then when the private sector starts to get ahead of you, you've built in an imperative to try and stop it or kill it. I think we're seeing that in the launch vehicle systems right now. Build in the flow. I don't know how you do it. I can't tell you how to do that. But look at some models. I'm sure they're out there so that you can dance with what's happening in the private sector and advance. Plug and play, modular, moving along. Focus on the goal. Lead. Focus tax dollars on advanced research in science, astronomy, exploration beyond the realm of commercial activities. Do that cool stuff. Put those rovers on Mars. Send those probes out beyond the solar system. That stuff, Hubble. That stuff is, Bob Zuber and I actually, God forbid, instead of arguing one night, actually decided to support Hubble. Why? Because it's just freaking cool. <laughs> support the genius of American enterprise and make tax investment in space a tax exempt, act, or investment in space a tax exempt activity. Most importantly, and leading up to my next point here before I, as I move towards the end of this, because I know you want to go hear the next sessions. The idea here is that we have to do something bold. If rubber chickens would take us to space, we'd be there by now. What we have to do is come out of this conference and do something. Rather than go home and go through your bag of collectibles and figure out what you're going to keep and what you're going to put in the treasure box for your grandkids, we have to do something coming out of here. The United States government, by the end of 2013, needs to declare that human settlement space is the goal of our national human space program, period. That's why we go. The baby is being born. It's time for us to get out there. Oh, I forgot to mention. It was the goal for the United States for four years. Steve Wolf, who I mentioned earlier, actually working for his boss, a Democrat, wrote a law that was joined by Bob Walker and several others on the other side of the aisle and was passed into law and signed by Ronald Reagan in 1988, declaring a, a bill that said it was to require the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to investigate and promote the development of human settlement in space and for other purposes. We already had a Space Settlement Act. For four glorious years, it was the law of the United States that the human spaceflight program was directed at settling space. It passed. And you know what we did? You know what we in the community did right after it passed? Some of you are really going to get this. We immediately got into the fight with the government about a launch vehicle system. And we let it go. And it got canceled four years later in the Clinton-Gore administration during the Paperwork Reduction Act. Because this was making NASA crazy. They did not want to report it on it. And there was no advocacy community out there writing it and staying on it. We were fighting, what was, some of you, I, th I think it was the National Launch System was what the, the vehicle of the vehicle du jour was at that point. Here's some of the findings. This, this is actually in the law. All we have to do is copy this. It's a photocopy. Oh, by the way, I got this from the National Space Society archives. <laughs> Thank you. Keeping history alive. Exploring, prospecting, and settling are parts of our heritage and will most assuredly be parts of our future. The United States space policy needs long-range goals. I mean, look at it. It's right there. All we got to do is rewrite it, update it. It's, uh, I think, three pages. 
I don't know what's three pages in government anymore, but three pages. What if, and I'm going to challenge Paul, I don't know if he's here, I'm going to challenge the leaders of the Space Frontier Foundation, I'm going to challenge the leaders of the Mars Society, I'm going to challenge the leaders of the Moon Society, which, by the way, are the, the four settlement-oriented organizations in Earthlight Five that are out there. Planetary, uh, you know, they've, they've come from we hate people to toasters are, are the way to go to space to, okay, maybe the astronauts. And, and they're, they're actually saying some good stuff now, and I, and I actually think they're going in a good direction, and we should bring them on board. AIAA, the other groups that are interested in, in the larger field, bring them on board. But the four or five settlement groups need to convene right away and put a plan together to make this our national agenda. We have never done a campaign in the human space flight, space settlement community in a period of time where we had Facebook, Twitter, and all these young people that you've seen running around this conference. We haven't done it. It's time. Let's take an action. Our goal is not building around. By the way, how many people in this room, I, I asked this at Space Access, it was really interesting. How many people in this room actually got involved in space, got involved at the very beginning based on a sound plan for short-term business profits? <laughs> right, right. At Space Access, I had two people raise their hand. One of them was too new, and the other one was my friend just being an asshole. But... <laughs> and I said that. I said, you're my buddy. You're just an asshole. You're just too new. You don't know. You got into it because you have a dream. We have a dream. We have a shared dream. We believe in something. It's time to come out of the airlock and tell the world we have a dream. We don't have to be ashamed. Yes. Show your business plan. Meet all the criteria of a good business plan. Show your ROI. Do all of that. That's critical. That's important. You have to do that. But don't be afraid to say it. Elon's out there. He's going to Mars. He's going to Mars, damn it. Right? Yeah. I want to go everywhere. <laughs> so I want to be on that. Uh, I want to be on Buzz's cycler. I just want to, like, Look out the window, oh, there's Mars, there's the moon, we're coming back around. Our goal is to take this planet, the life of this planet, and spread it to worlds now dead. That's what we're about. And this, folks, is our revolution to lead. If not us, who? If not now, when? It's taken too long to get to this point. I made a vow with my friends Peter and all these other people sitting in a bar, a lot of things happened in the bar in the old days, uh, sitting in a bar in Princeton at an SSI conference, that we were going to pledge our lives and fortunes to making this happen in our lifetime. Now, I'm working on life extension, and I'm trying to cut down on the carbs. But I want it to happen. I want it to happen now. Help me make this happen. Be involved. Do something when you leave here. Those of you who are involved in the leadership of NSS, please carry this message back into your board meetings or wherever you can. We need to form a co not one of these aerospace company bought and paid for coalition to support my latest, you know, pork barrel thing. A real coalition of the willing and the caring and the dreamers who are going to go out and pass the Space Settlement Act of 2013. Thank you. I have one video clip I forgot to show. Um, everybody's got to have a video clip. Um, there was a recent launch that you may have heard of, and um, by some interesting fluke, uh, I got our production company uh, has signed a deal. This was aired the morning of. Three, two, one. The series will be on the air early next year. Well, we've done a remarkable job. Thank you very much, Rick. We've actually pulled ourselves back on time and actually have time for some questions. So after that kind of presentation, I have no doubt there are going to be questions. So please, 
if you have any, uh, I'm not sure if we have any microphones in this room, but we can probably hear if you shout. So, oh, that's great. Bill? You know, I, I don't think we did anything wrong. You know, at, at the beginning of any revolution, at the beginning of any cultural change or societal change, um, there are people that get out there a little early. You know, one of the issues we're having in Texas is uh, they, they gave $5 million to spaceports about 10 years ago, and it got wasted away. They were too early to the game, and so we're having to go back and re-educate them. Um, I think it's just a case of getting there, uh, you know, early. But... You know, what we're doing with the uh, aerospace community and NASA and the entire culture, you know, I, I, I think I've said this before, but, um, you know, people will hold up an iPhone and say it's a new interface, it's a paradigm change. That's not a paradigm change, that's a new interface in your iPhone. We actually get to use the word paradigm change, paradigm shift. We, we're doing Copernican stuff here. And what we're doing, in a sense, is like trying to change an aircraft carrier by nuzzling up in it, front of it with a rowboat you know, trying to get it to change, but we are changing its course. So um, I celebrate Newt for getting out there, you know. Um, I'm not real happy that he apologized for it this time when he shut down. I thought that was, uh, you know, but I understand what was happening there. So I'm glad he, I'm glad he was out there early. I had, my, I had my little seed corn. I think I've still got that somewhere. Newt gave out little vials of seed corn at the L5 conference and said space is the seed corn of our future, so... Stun them into silence. Awesome. Oh, yes, sir. Uh oh. <laughs> I just want you to explain something that uh, people may not understand. You mentioned something about the Alderman cycle. Uh huh. Oh, uh, Buzz for years has been pushing the idea, and I'm going to get this wrong, uh, but has been pushing the idea of a cycling spaceship that basically using whatever method of propulsion you put into motion and actually just as a constant cycler running between destinations in space. And all you have to do at that point as opposed to building vehicles to go from point A to destination B is get up to the cycler and take the ride. And I think it was the National Commission in Space. It was, may have been 1986. So the ideas are out there. I mean, that's one thing we've got is some brilliant people some very visionary people and some fantastic ideas. I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. Um, we've got the ideas. We've got that. We just got to get into action and, and leverage off of what we got for us right out there. You know, real quick, planetary resources guys got out there and said, um, I should charge them like a trillion for this. Anyway, um, planetary resources guys got out there and said that they were swamped with investors, that they got a positive response, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's, that audience is out there. We don't need to be afraid. That's what I'm saying. Come out of the airlock. Let's just do it. Any others? Coming out with the uh, public announcement of the group until you said July? Uh, yeah, we're just trying to get it right. So what can uh, uh, all of our, our group here do in any way to assist you Either ideas, communicating, or... Well, um, one of the things, again, we want to stay... I, we don't want to try and be NSS or Space Frontier or any other groups. We want to have a relationship, in fact, to the community. Um, and I want to use this very carefully, but in the early days of SSI, there was a great relationship with the community where SSI provided vision and, and research base, etc. We want to kind of have that relationship with the other... One of the greatest moments in my life was when I got put in charge of the Fines Endowment. Foundation for International Non-Government Development of Space, and, and Walt Anderson put $25 million in the bank. My job description was uh, find cool space projects that are on the critical path of space and give them money. Uh, <laughs> I called up my buddy. I said, I am living a Heinlein novel right now. Um, but what we want to do is, is get people involved. So one thing you could do, uh, as we get the Encyclopedia Galactica up, Pick your area that you're passionate about. We're, we're creating what we call alpha librarians. We're going to have librarians. We want to create a culture of librarianism 
um, and, and to where you can come in there and take your passion and build that branch. And then somebody will build off of your branch and that will connect to another branch. So as we get that up, we'll let you know and, and just come on in. Uh, I know you're space solar power oriented, come work on that branch. Somebody else literally may be into lunarized drill bits. You know, sex in space, we don't care. Come on in, make it yours and give it away to the next person and let's create the Encyclopedia Galactica. <clears throat> I'd just like to thank Rick tremendously. It was a fantastic presentation. What we need is thought-provoking conversations, whether it's technical, policy, whatever it might be. And Rick, I've seen speak many times, and we have no doubt that he will always challenge us to think. And I'm sure everyone in this room will take on board the comments and the thoughts and the ideas and weave them into uh, your own thinking. And so we really appreciate you coming along and giving us the time. And I also really appreciate uh, presenters and the audience for managing to bring us actually back to the scheduled time uh, <clears throat> because we want to give all of our presenters during the afternoon the opportunity to let you well, hear Well, I can keep talking and I... <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you one and all. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch um, and please take a quick break and go to the next sessions and we'll keep the afternoon rolling. Thank you. Thank you.